Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to first look interpreting early European artistic renderings of the New World, a live online professional development seminar sponsored by the National Humanities Center and Lafayette County's Teaching American History Project, Bringing History Alive. I'm Richard Schramm, the Vice President for Education Programs here at the National Humanities Center, and I will be moderating this evening's session. Uh, please bear with me because I have a cold, so if my voice disintegrates during the evening, uh, don't panic. Um, the National Humanities Center will be sponsoring uh, and organizing several uh, online professional development seminars throughout your Teaching American History Project. <clears throat> and, and tonight, I would like to take a minute just to introduce you to the Humanities Center. Uh, we won't have this introduction in subsequent seminars. But this evening, I'd like to tell you that the center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina that's tucked in among the cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. We are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Now that's a real mouthful. Let me see if I can deconstruct that for you. First of all, we're an independent institution. That means we're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means that the main program we offer is a fellowship program that brings scholars, usually college and university professors, to the center from all over the world for an academic year during which they research and write on topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978, and since then about 1,100 scholars have worked here, and they've produced about 1,200 books. Now that may make the play sound like an ivory tower, and from these pictures, you can see it could pass for an ivory tower. We even have a spiral staircase going right up through the center of the building. But the center was not intended to be an ivory tower. The founders wanted it to connect with a wide array of audiences, and they were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And today we do that in three ways. First of all, we offer online seminars. Now the seminar we're offering tonight, we've designed expressly for the Osceola Teaching American History Grant. But in addition to these seminars, we offer seminars for teachers all across the country. You can find out what they are by checking into our website. If you'd like to join a seminar, uh, you better hurry because they're filling up rather quickly. In addition to our seminars, we have two websites. The first is called TeacherServe, which consists of three what we call instructional guides. One deals with religion in American history, the other with the environment in American history, and the third with teaching African-American literature and history. These guides consist of essays written by leading scholars that illuminate important topics in these three areas of American culture. Not only do they illuminate those topics, but they also offer advice on how to teach them. In addition, we offer our toolbox library. This is a collection of primary sources, historical documents, literary text, images, audio material, organized thematically within chronological frames and illuminated by extensive notes and interpretive questions. They are ideal for classroom instruction. Now, for some of the material tonight, we sent you to American Beginnings, the European Presence in North America from 1492 to 1690. I'll be referring again to that, uh, to that um, toolbox uh, as we go along in this introduction. Now, if you'd like to keep abreast of what's going on at the Humanities Center, as far as our education programs are concerned, find out when we put up new material on TeacherServe or introduce a new toolbox, please become a fan of our Facebook page. That way, you will not miss anything. Now, let me tell you about what you'll find uh, after this seminar. You will be able to access a recording of the seminar and the PowerPoint presentation on the, through the very same website that you obtained the text for the seminar. On that website, you will also find a link to an evaluation form. We ask you to please fill that evaluation form out. You can do it online and submit it online. It is very important to us and also to the folks running the Teaching American History Grant. We pay attention to what you say and they pay attention to what you say as well. And we use what you tell us in your evaluations to uh, improve our seminars. As I say, you will also find the PowerPoint there. Please feel free to plunder the PowerPoint. Use it however you wish for your own instructional purposes. It's there for you. You will also receive from us documentation of participation. This will be a letter certifying that you've successfully participated in this seminar, and you'll be able to present that letter to whatever local certifying authority there is in Osceola County to obtain whatever recertification credit your participation in the seminar warrants. 
Now, let me explain how the seminar is going to work. Professor Gaudio is going to lecture, and his lecture will be key to a presentation of slides with text excerpts that illustrate important points. He will stop routinely through the lecture to uh, discuss some of the slides. We're not going to discuss all of them. But again, I want to emphasize that the PowerPoint he'll be using will be available to you for your own instructional purposes. Now, how do you participate? Well, if you want to speak up, if you have a question or a comment, you can click that little hand raised icon right there. I will see that, and when I do, I'll pass the microphone to you. Right now, your microphones are red. When your microphone turns green, that means it's turned on. You can hold forth with your question or your comment, and I will turn your microphone off after that, and uh, Professor Gaudio will address what you have to say. If you don't want to uh, raise your hand and talk, you can send us a chat message by putting your cursor in the little box next to the arrow down there at the bottom of the screen. Type your message in that box, and then click the Send button. That will put your message up into the chat panel right here. Now, as the chat scrolls through this evening, it may become distracting to you. So if it does, you can close the chat panel by clicking that arrow right there. That will shut your chat panel. Don't worry about missing any chat, because as the moderator, I will be bringing in the chat uh, into the discussion as it is warranted. Um, now, are there any questions before we plunge ahead? If everybody's ready to go, send me one of those little smiley face icons that you see on your screen there. There we go. Ah, oh, that's always good to see. Makes me feel good. Great. Okay, well, I think we're ready to plunge ahead now. So let's move on to see how Europeans interpreted their first contacts with the New World. We have two simple goals this evening. First, to deepen understanding of how and why Europeans interpreted the New World as they did upon first encountering it, and then to provide fresh ways to teach the European encounter with the New World. Now, some of you participated in the forum uh, that we offered you before the seminar, and I called from there some, from the forum some, uh, some themes that kept coming back over and over again. And the first theme was you simply don't have enough time to teach your courses. You don't have enough time to address this topic in them. Well, I wish we could do something about that, but we can't. But I wanted to acknowledge to you that we heard what you said, and uh, that, that is a common lament among teachers in all of our seminars. There simply isn't enough time. You also want to expand your general knowledge about the topic. And several of you are interested in integrating art into history and social studies courses. On that last score, let me refer you to that American Beginnings toolbox that I mentioned earlier. A lot of the texts that we'll be using tonight come from this section right here, the contact section. We sent you to that uh, section of the toolbox um, to, uh, to, to get some of your texts. Now, if you go to American Beginnings and you go over here to the left-hand side and you click on this section, Discussing Art, that will take you to this, a simple four-step way to integrate art into your classes. It's a very good uh, tactic to get discussion going about images uh, in your classes. I won't go into it in great detail now, but we've used it here at the National Humanities Center many times in our seminars, and it does really generate insightful and profitable discussion. So I urge you to look into that. Uh, you'll find that in all of our toolboxes, but particularly in this one, that's the one that's most pertinent for us tonight is American Beginnings. Now, as we move through uh, the seminar this evening, I want you to keep your students in mind. And I ask you to do that because neither Professor Gaudio nor I is an expert in how to translate this material for students. And we have a wide range of teachers here this evening. Some of you teach fifth grade, some of you teach eighth grade, some of you teach high school. So I'd like all of you to be thinking about how you would use this material with your particular students. We're going to encounter monsters, animals, bugs, Native Americans, kings and queens, and I think in that mix, there's probably a great deal to interest uh, all students. So in the chat, as you see something that would work with your students, share that with us. Tell us how you might use those images with elementary, middle, or high school students. What topics and concepts might you teach through them? If you don't get it into the chat this evening, if something occurs to you later on, we're going to keep the form open for a while. So please go to the form and post your teaching suggestions there so that your colleagues can see them. Okay, then, 
Let me introduce our speaker this evening. We're pleased to have with us Michael Gaudio, who is an assistant professor of art history at the University of Minnesota. His main area of research and interest is the visual culture of early modern Europe and the Atlantic world. He's published widely on that. You see a couple of his publications, his most recent one in 2008, Engraving the Savage, the New World, and the Techniques of Civilization. So now let me turn the program over to Michael, who will lead us in this evening's seminar. Michael, it's all yours. All right. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, let me see if this is... Okay. There we go. Um, so I'm going to be talking with you and discussing with you uh, about John White's watercolors of the New World. Those, those will be really the focus of what I have to say today, and but they won't be the only things that will be raised in the discussion. But they provide a really great case study, I think, into um, seeing how Europeans responded to their encounter with, with the New World, the peoples of the New World, with the uh, as well as with the flora and fauna of the New World, John White's watercolors exist as as a pretty coherent group of images that are that still survive in the British Museum, and so they're there for us to look at and have images of. Uh, so we'll be focusing on those today. Actually, I'm I'm interested as as we get started. How many of you are familiar with with John White's images of of the Americas? If you're familiar with uh, John White's images, uh, why don't you send us a uh, a green check? You see that green check next to the hand raised icon there? We have a few. Okay. Ah, okay. Kelly Cotton is not. Okay. We have um, some. A few are. Well, okay. Not too many. Well, I hope you'll be much more familiar by the end <laughs> of what of what we have, uh, what we do here today. Um, a few questions, to sort of framing questions to start out with as, as we get into these. I, I, a few issues I want to think about. And again, I recognize, so just to reiterate what Richard said, that there are a lot of different uh, grade levels represented by, by all of you. And I don't presume that everything I have to say is going to, to, to translate into um, all of your classes. But I do hope the, the general questions and problems that, are ra that I, I raise here about John White's in images are things that you might find a way of translating in, into your classes if, if, you, if you find the time to bring them in. Um, but one of, the, one of the key issues, one of the really interesting issues that White's images raise are where art and science might intersect. What are the, what are the relationships between art and science in making in Europe's response to, visual response to the new world? Um, how might those images, these watercolors, have been seen by John White's contemporaries? How did his own world interpret these images? What kind of meanings did they hold for John White's original audiences? And then, if, if we have time, too, I, I, I would like to consider as well the impact that White's images have on later generations. They're an incredibly influential body of images um, used and reused again and again over the centuries, and they, they continue to be widely published, and I think just a little bit about that. Uh, here just a uh, um, group of John White's images to start off. They, they range over all kinds of subjects. Here you see three depictions of the um, Algonquins of Virginia. And this is um, the, the region that John White depicts. And I'll say in just a second a little bit more about his story and, and the peoples he encounters. There, maybe the, the way to start that story is with the title page that John White himself made for his collection of watercolors. So um, it's this, the original watercolors exist as this body of about 80, 80 sheets that are at the, at the British Museum. And at the top of them is this title page that reads the pictures of sundry things collected and counterfeited according to the truth. So there's this real claim for the truth of these images. In the voyage made by Sir Walter Raleigh Knight, um, that's not true. Walter Raleigh didn't, was not actually on this voyage, so he's an important player in it. Uh, for the discovery of La Virginia in the 27th year of our, the most happy reign of our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth. So that, that the, the title page itself raises kind of the key players in this story, uh, all this happening in 1585. Uh, so the basic story is, is this. John White uh, travels to Virginia, which Virginia in 1585, which is, encompasses a very large region that the British 
sort of claim. Uh, and but uh, is really in present day North Carolina. And here you see John White's own map of the outer banks of, of North Carolina. And uh, but can you see all my can you see my cursor as I move it on the screen? Uh, no, Michael, if you want to do that, go up to the uh, arrow that's at the uh, uh, left hand side <clears throat> from the uh, eraser and all those things at the top of your screen. Yes. Click on that arrow, and that will be your cur that that will. Uh, oh, okay. There we go. You can see that then. Uh, actually, I can't. Hmm. Well, uh, laser pointer. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, I think you're going to have to. Put, there you go. There you go. All right. Keep your. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um. This, uh. So this is John White's map that he made of the, of the again, what was then Virginia is now the Outer Banks of North Carolina. And he, he came as part of a surveying team for the first Roanoke colony. And Roanoke is this island, this, this island right here that the, the British come over. It's, it's essentially a military expedition that comes over. And White's job is to survey and depict what he sees. Uh, and his famous collection of watercolor drawings is a result of this trip. And John White actually has a really interesting story because he, he in 1587, so, so they returned to England after this initial expedi military expedition. In 1587, he returns to America with colonists uh, to establish a colony uh, with women and children as part of it uh, on this island of Roanoke. Um, it, goes through all some of the trials and tribulations that colonies generally um, did then. And so White later in 1587 travels back to England in order to resup resupply and, and bring those presumably back the next year. But uh, he gets held up in England by England's war with Spain and the Spanish Armada. And he's unable to return to Virginia until 1590, so a few years later. And by that point, the colonists have uh, disappeared. And this is the, the famous lost colony of Roanoke. Uh, but John White has this really key role to play in it, both as an artist and then subsequently as a, as a governor. In fact, he, his, his grandchild, Virginia Dare, is the first English child born in, in the Americas. There's a whole, there's a kind of blockbuster movie in here that nobody's named yet. Mm, it's not advancing. Let's see. There we go. Uh, so just to introduce the the key players in this story, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, who's mentioned on John's John White's title page to his watercolors. Elizabeth is, um, I mean, Virginia is named after Elizabeth. She's the Virgin Queen. It's named um, Virginia. Uh, she is ultimately the authority behind this colony, but she's, uh, importantly, she's not the actual sponsor of it. She's not funding this, this expedition. Uh, it's privately funded, and that's important to keep in mind because I think John White's watercolors have a real role to play in gaining funding and attracting investors to the colony. Sir Walter Raleigh is involved very much in it. He's a kind of, he's, he's a key sponsor of it and who's very interested in, in exploring the new world. Um, Thomas Harriet is a, uh, essentially John White's partner in this fact gathering mission in, in Virginia. Um, and it's John, it's Thomas Harriet's text that ultimately accompanies John White's images in the publication that results from, from this venture in 1590, a, a publication that's illustrated uh, and published by this figure right here, Theodore de Brie, a Flemish engraver and publisher who copies White's watercolors in, in the form of engravings and really makes them known to a very wide European audience. And in fact, this it's, Debris will crop up again, crop up again um, frequently, and the images that we're looking at here. So it's it's good to have a better sense of who he is to begin with. Uh, I believe the reading that you took a look at were excerpts from Debris's um, volume. The, the the publication that Debris puts out is called A Brief and True Report of the Newfoundland of Virginia. 
um, which is indeed brief, not altogether true. Uh, it's, uh, but it has Thomas Harriet's text, John White's watercolors, you, um, made into engravings. You see a couple of them here, the title page on the left. It's published in four languages, uh, English, German, Latin, and French. So it reaches a very wide audience, uh, has a very wide audience in mind when it's being made. Uh, 28 engravings based on, on John White's Virginia watercolors, mostly of the native Algonquins that the English encountered in Virginia, showing the various customs and habits and practices and, and costumes. Uh, and and this, this turned out to be a real uh, successful publication for Theodore de Brie, and, and it became the first, he, when he published this, he discovered that he could really find a, a, a wide audience for his publications on the New World. So this actually became the, the first volume of a 13-part series illustrated by Theodore de Brie on uh, the Americas. Um, and it, this lasted over 40 years. The Debris family continued putting out these volumes, and we know them as Debris America, or sometimes called Debris Great Voyages. And they look at all different voyages made by Europeans, particularly Protestant nations, to the new to the new world. And they're all illustrated. They're all meant to um, they're essentially early coffee table books, meant to really involve you and get you fascinated visually with the with, with this uh, new world. Uh, so that, that's a key publication, um, a way of popularizing White's work. Now, so I, I'd like to start off thinking about these, some of the ways of looking at John White's work and this question of art and science that I mentioned before. And so as we, as we look at, at the following slides, I, I'd like to think about a couple of questions. Are John White's drawings faithful depictions of what he saw in Virginia. Uh, that's, um, it, there's this r remarkable naturalism to us uh, when, you, when you look at him, and we'll think about that naturalism. And they, and they have this sense of John White depicting what he sees and recording all of this information and um, bringing back new facts to, to, to Europe. So that, that's something to keep in mind, the scientific value of this expedition. And then, all, but also the question: Are John White's drawings shaped by his own cultural habits and preconceptions? What of John White's own cultural background makes its way into these visual images? Uh, and it's interesting to think about these questions of the artfulness and the scientific value of John White's images side by side. And as an art historian, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm interested in pictures themselves and, and how to interpret them. M my goal is not to arrive at an you know, a definitive answer to these questions. I, I, I think in a lot of ways they are faithful depictions of what John White saw, but at the same time, I think they're also shaped by his own historical background. And I, I want to think about these things, along, these questions alongside one another. So one really important thing to keep in mind as we, as we look at John White's work is, you know, is the Renaissance itself. John White is a Renaissance artist. And one of the chief um, characteristics we associate with this historical moment that we call the Renaissance is a new naturalism in the visual arts, a new attention to the natural world, a new attempt to describe the, the particulars of, of, of the world around artists. And you see that in uh, in a variety of artists, and, and 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 I think too in a variety of of imagery that's um, is very accessible. I, I again I know that you represent a lot of different um, grades from elementary school through through high school, but I think a lot of this imagery from scientific naturalistic imagery from the Renaissance is something that um, students will often respond to. So for example, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, a name just about everybody is familiar with, and I give as an example of this new naturalism, his depiction of the bones of the arm. Um, um, Leonardo's notebooks are these fascinating documents of this new attention to the human body, and Leonardo da Vinci is doing things like dissecting cadavers, which is something nobody was doing before the 16th century, uh, or very few people were doing before the 16th century, and, and but Leonardo is an artist doing this in order to learn the structure of the human body and then recording these things in his notebooks. Albrecht Dürer, another con a contemporary of, of Leonardo da Vinci, is, is in images like his hair 
on the left hand side is, is showing this meticulous attention to the natural world. Um, and John White belongs to this new, new interest in, in nature, this new observation of the natural world. And it, it's an idea, the, the, it's, the, these new, this new naturalism is really summed up by, by Francis Bacon. I, I include a quote by him on the screen. He's a, probably the philosopher who was the greatest spokesman of this new attention to nature, an English philosopher and a contemporary of John White. And this is just one of many things Bacon says about the importance of looking closely at nature. He says, all depends on keeping the eye steadily fixed upon the facts of nature, and so receiving their images simply as they are. For God forbid that we should give out a dream of our own imagination for a pattern of the world. So there you have this idea that the, 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 goal, the goal is to observe carefully and not, not put yourself, not put your own artfulness into your depictions of nature, but to let nature through a scientific point of view, speak for itself. Uh, you see that coming across in, in White's images. But what, what this also raises, you know, if, if the Renaissance is this moment of a new naturalism in the visual arts, then it raises the question, you know, what happened before? And what is this new naturalism replacing if, it, if it's coming to uh, uh, sort of a, an alternative approach to traditional ways of looking at the world? And, and this raises, um, um, a, a really interesting um, way of thinking about John White's images. Something to think about them in relation to is, is the monstrous races. And this is a very strong medieval tradition, really a classical tradition. It's, it's, its origins go back to classical antiquity that continued to survive in, in John White's world, although it's, um, his, his visual images seem to depart from this tradition. But it's this very old tradition of depicting the people at the furthest reaches of the known world um, as the monstrous races. The gr great material to, I think, bring into the classroom. Um, it, uh, there's all kinds of visual images out there. I'll show you a few of them here, but uh, it's, it's not hard to sort of dig up this visual imagery and, and uh, the, the kind of thing I know my college students respond to, and I can imagine students from elementary school to high school responding to it too. Again, it, it's a tradition that goes back to classical antiquity. It includes creatures like the, the blemies, uh, who are these, these creatures that have heads in their chests. And uh, it includes, and this, so as you see on the left-hand side of the screen here, the figure of a blemmy is taken from a medieval manuscript, a bestiary, a, a compendium of beasts. Um, and the blemmy is one of the figures out of there. It includes figures like the skyopod. And this is uh, an illustration on the right-hand side of the screen, actually from a late 15th century volume. So these have continued to have a long life and survive into the Renaissance. Um, a picture of a skyopod. Skyopods are some of my favorite monstrous races. They are these uh, creatures that were supposed to live in India. Again, they're always, you know, monstrous races are, are you know, inventions of Europeans, these projections of Europeans, but always onto the edges of the known world. India was at the edges of the known world for Europeans. So they live in India and they have one giant foot and they're extremely swift and they travel very fast on this foot under the heat of the sun and when they get very hot from the sun and from, from all their running around they slow down and, and, and lay down and, and shield themselves from the sun with their giant foot. Um, skyopod means umbrella foot. And, uh, uh, these are just two of the many examples of the monstrous races. Michael, let me ask a question here. Were these depictions of monsters based on any sort of observation or any sort of description, or were they just whole cloth out of somebody's imagination? Yeah, no, no, that's a good question. They, they do. They come out of um, a, a variety of ancient sources originally. Um, perhaps the earliest is Homer. Uh, they, let me actually go to the, ne well, no, well, we'll see it soon. Things like the Cyclops, for example from Homer's Odyssey. Odysseus, on his voyages home from Troy to back to his home of Ithaca, encounters various monsters such as the sky or uh, uh, as the Cyclops. They also come from the Greek historian Herodotus, who is a really interesting figure, and in some ways a, a kind of ancient Greek John White, because Herodotus is a Greek who, unlike most Greeks, was interested in traveling um, beyond Greece and into uh, into um, uh, other regions and recording what he saw, not in visual images, but in his history. And 
So he, he has a lot of information about the peoples he encounters. But then um, as for the people at the edges of the world, he doesn't actually visit. He goes by hearsay. And, and it's through Herodotus originally that a lot of these monstrous races come. So he describes figures like the Blemmy and the Skyapod. I think both of those are in Herodotus. Um, I can't remember for certain, but a lot of them are. Um, can, um, anthropophagi, that is, man-eaters. And then these, these continue to be recycled after Herodotus. The Roman historian Pliny um, catalogs the various monstrous races. And so Pliny's history was a key source in, in the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance for information about the monstrous races. A number of the teachers have been responding about how to use these images with some great suggestions, but uh, it has arisen that there may be some problems over the fact that these critters aren't wearing any clothes. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, with, with a PowerPoint presentation, of course, you can do some cropping. So right. you can easily crop out uh, yeah. parts that might, uh, <clears throat> might offend. So. Yeah, and, and, I would, and I would stress too that if you do a search around the web for monstrous races, uh, you, you're going to find a lot more images than what I'm offering here. Yeah, the, the, the Blemmy in particular seems to be uh, lacking in, in, in any clothing of any type, but um, you'll find other kinds of imagery as well. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Uh, nothing. I was going to suggest we move on. Yeah, and uh, and I think related to to the monstrous races and leading us back to John White too is this question of. Um, Maps. What you're looking at here is a medieval world map, which is very closely tied to how the monster, monstrous races were, were understood. And uh, they, they, monstrous races were placed at the edges of the medieval map. So here you see, you see a detail of the map on the left. On the right, you see a detail of the map on the left. This is the Hereford world map, a very famous medieval map of the world. And uh, corresponds to a basic formula for medieval maps where Jerusalem, the, the sacred center, the Christian center of the world is placed at the very middle of the map. And the farther you get from it, the closer to the edges of the world you are. And so at the furthest edges of the world is where you encounter the monstrous races. And there you see in the detail some of these various monstrous races. There you see the Blemmy down at the, at, at the very bottom here, and then a bunch of other monstrous races. Uh, um, and it's, um, I, I actually, I'd be interested to know how many use maps, old maps in, in teaching. Is, is that something that you've, that you've done in teaching? <clears throat> Many of you use, do you use maps or old maps in your teaching? Let's see, we have a comment here. Let me pass the microphone. Andre, it's all yours. Excellent. I was just going to say that in our eighth grade U.S. history curriculum, we do use a lot of the old maps beginning with, you know, before the revolutionary period, during the Spanish exploration. Not only our textbooks, but a lot of our supplemental materials have those maps, and they're um, also incorporated in our PowerPoint. So they've been helpful, and the kids actually enjoy to see the, the perception, and then you know comparing that to a current map. Right, right. Yeah, I, I have the same experience with with, with maps and in, in teaching you know my my college students because they, especially when when you're thinking about really the topic of of um, what we're looking at today, which is the encounter with the unfamiliar. There, there are ways of. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't go ahead, please. We, then when we get through there, we have another comment. Okay. There, there, there are ways of giving a kind of physical and spatial um, uh, layout to these, what in to a large extent are conceptual issues. They give us the, the, a way of, of grounding um, uh, ways of thinking about the encounter with the unknown. So when you look at this, you see in a very physical way how why the you know, Europeans imagine the monstrous races as they did because they exist quite literally at the edges of the known world. Okay, we're going to pass the microphone now to S. Stone. Um, uh, yes, take it away. Yes, in my high school tech lab, what we are required to do as part of our literacy campaign is to work with tech speakers. So we use maps, we use comparisons, we look at safety maps, um, charts and graphs. Those are all skills that we work with because of the dreaded state test that we have to deal with. Uh, I got I got some of that. Uh, uh, I missed the quality of the sound was kind of low on my end, so I so I missed. I'm afraid. Um, I'm we're required to, to use these in our FCAT. That's a state required test. We have a literacy uh -huh. council, and okay. as a result, one of our things is tech features, and we've been uh, thrusting on my high schools. We talk about maps, charts, graphs as ways to um, for comparison, developing thinking maps, for writing prompts. So we'll be using maps a great deal this year. 
Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Uh, and in the chat, Michael, we've had a lot of people saying that they use maps, both contemporary and ancient. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, the, these monstrous races, as we've been talking about them, and John White's work is fundamentally related to this kind of spatial imagining of the world through maps. And John White was a map maker as well as, as uh, you know, the picture of peoples and, and flora and fauna. So, in fact, it's uh, here that you see on the screen here. Uh, um, and maybe this can be a subject for discussion for getting back into John White here from the monstrous races. Uh, I think it's, it's really interesting to look at the medieval model of the world and its way of depicting the unfamiliar in relationship to what White offers. I mean, if he's if he's representing this new naturalism coming into the visual arts and to map making, um, how, in what ways can um, you know using these two examples on the screen here? In what ways? Uh, do do these maps express different world views? Uh, I think that would be uh, we could talk about that a little bit, perhaps. And how do they express different world views? People commenting on the artistry of the maps, <clears throat> and they, they really are beautiful, particularly mm -hmm. maps White in Virginia. Right. Right. Okay. The perspective, for one thing. Right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's one of the key innovations of Renaissance map making is, is bringing in, you know, if, if Renaissance picture makers bring linear perspective, new methods of depicting space into painting, of course, map makers are bringing new perspective techniques in, in, into um, map making and really rethinking what it means to depict the world. I mean, in in the medieval map. <laughs> Again, it's it's a sacred geography. Jerusalem is put at the center, and everything is centered on Jerusalem. The monstrous races, the unfamiliar, are defined because they're as far as possible from that sacred center of the map. Uh, in the new maps of the Renaissance, the new methods of cartography, you know, what is perspective? Perspective is a point of view, right? Um, using perspective projections in map in map making allows you to put the center of the map wherever you want to put it. And that's one of the key inter innovations, right? White, white can depict the Atlantic coast um, of, of North America and, and, put, and put that at the very center of his map. You know, no longer do you have to have Jerusalem at the center. So certainly, John White's, you know, it's, it's an amazing, the artistry of the map is remarkable. And, and you have these, these various creatures that do represent the, just the unknown or, or the unfamiliar and maybe holdovers from some of the imagery that you see on that medieval world map. And yet, at, at the same time, such a very different way of thinking about the world, right? The world is, um, uh, you define the world in the, in the new kinds of map making by wherever you put yourself. Whereas in the medieval map, the world is always defined by that sacred, by that sacred center. Um, and the, the interesting thing about the monstrous races is that the, you know, they don't suddenly disappear. And particularly in the 16th century, the, you know, the century in which White is working, you have this fascinating coexistence of new Renaissance techniques of naturalistic description and an interest in, in reporting on, on eyewitness accounts and the survival of the monstrous races. So for example, on the right side of the screen, I, I include two images that are taken from a 16th century costume book. It was a very popular type of book that just describes the various customs and costumes of the world. And it includes both peoples of the new world, it includes, includes people from all over the world, but includes peoples of the new world, including the Brazilian that you see on the left-hand side, who's based upon reports coming back in travel literature and visual images from peoples encountered in Brazil describing with a great deal of ethnographic accuracy specific ornaments, for example, worn by Chupanamba Indians in, in Brazil, while at the same time you have figures like the Cyclops <laughs> um, th that are taken out of, you know, Homer. And, and these, these continue to serve, survive alongside, and it's, it's hard to get your mind around this, but they, they, these, kind of, these two ways of looking at the world and looking at the unknown exist right alongside one another uh, or down below. 
um, Sir Walter Raleigh, when he, 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 though he doesn't actually physically visit Virginia, he does go to, North, or to South America, to Guiana, and publishes an account of his experiences in Guiana. And in one edition that's published in Germany in 1599 includes the illustration that you see on the screen, which pictures South Americans, South American Indians as blemies, <laughs> straight out of the, uh, the tradition of the monstrous races. So it's a it's a world. I, I guess the point of this is that the, the the world in which John White is working is um, it's a world where a lot is changing. A lot of new modes of thinking and responding to the unfamiliar are are present, but existing alongside older ones. And it's it's a world that's in flux, very much in flux in that way. Um, now I think it's also worth thinking about John White's images alongside and 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 the kind of the, the particular kind of naturalism he might bring to the visual arts and the depiction of the new world alongside how his contemporaries are depicting the Americas. And we have, we're, we're lucky to have a, some examples. John White, you know, what's interesting is that you have John White depicting Virginia in 1585, um, though uh, Europeans had been going to the new world for a hundred years. You know, the Col Columbus landed in the West Indies a hundred years earlier, but actually you have very few visual images in that first hundred years. And then particularly in the late 16th century with people like John White, um, other artists working in Mexico, and people like Jacques Lemoyne you have right here, and another example I'll show you, you start to see many, many more in images being um, made of the new world. So in some ways, this kind of efflorescence of visual imagery of the new world in the late 16th century. And so we have some interesting people to compare John White to. This, this engraving that you see on the screen was, is also by Theodore Debris in the second volume of his series of America, which is based upon Florida. So um, th this might be, um, as, as uh, teachers in uh, Florida, um, might, might be a, a, an artist that you've encountered before. Jacques Lemoyne was part of a uh, a Protestant, French Protestant mission to Florida in the 1560s uh, that attempted to establish a colony. It was unsuccessful, but Lemoyne was part of this expedition, and like John White, he was charged essentially with recording visually the peoples that they encountered and um, made a lot of remarkable images. Unfortunately, we don't have the originals of, jo of Jacques, like we, we, we have the originals of, of John White's. Um, but, we don't have the originals of Lemoyne's, but we do have degrees and gradients, and, and they're really remarkable images. They, they're depictions of mostly the Tumukuan Indians in Florida. This particular image shows the Tumukuan, a particular ritual in which they offer a stag to, to the sun. And so Lemoyne is very interested, like John White, in customs of the, of the American Indians. Um, but one of, one of the really interesting things about Jacques Lemoyne, one of the really, and it's interesting to compare him to White in this way, is that Lemoyne is always thinking about the New World in relationship to Europe. He's always comparing. He's very often in his images, including the French, um, right alongside the Tumukuans. So in this case, for example, you have the figure of a, a couple of French soldier, soldiers right here standing next to the Tamakawin um, uh, figure, I believe. Um, there's a couple of figures. I think this is supposed to be the figure of uh, Athore uh, in, in the accounts. In any case, a, a chieftain figure in Tamakawin society. And, and they're standing alongside the, the, the various Frenchmen here. And through details like this, Jacques Lemoyne is asking us to, to always to understand the new world in relationship to the old. And even visually speaking, there, there's all kinds of comparisons that Lemoyne is asking us to think about. So he, he attends very closely, for example, to the um, fashionable slashed breeches of the French soldiers. This is very, the sol soldiers in the 16th century were known for their um, uh, uh, fashionable, sometimes outlandish clothing. And Lemoyne is very interested in that. And he's also interested in showing you that fashionable clothing alongside Tamakuan tattooing practices and asking us to think through comparisons like this about how the um, natives of the New World and the, the uh, Europeans ornament themselves. Um, and perhaps from that, asking us to think more broadly about um, human civilizations as um, 
defining themselves through the way that they ornament their bodies. So there, there's always ways in which Lamon is asking us to con contemplate through comparison. Even, even the scene that we see right here, the offering of a stag to the sun, is based uh, upon imagery that's taken straight from Europe, from the Old Testament story of the dance around the golden calf that the Israelites, um, uh, when, when Moses goes up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, the Israelites fall into idolatry and produce a, an idol of the golden calf and dance around it. And the imagery of that uh, I should have brought in an image of it, but it's it's very much like um, this image that you see here. So through that comparison, he's asking us to, to think about the new world in relationship to the old. And this is something that you often see in the, liter the literature as well. And perhaps one of the most famous um, uh, figures who who was fond of comparing the the new world to the old is Michel de Montaigne, another Frenchman, who writes in his um, essays. Uh, about the New World, such as his essay on cannibals, where he 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 uh, thinks about the reports of cannibalism in the New World that are coming back in in great numbers from the Americas, and he even talks to um, supposed New World cannibals that are brought as captives back to Europe, and he records a conversation that he he says he has with one. Uh, but but then he comes to this conclusion that uh, we, we may well call these people barbarians in respect to the rules of reason, but not in respect to ourselves, who surpass them in every kind of barbarity. So he uses this as a kind of moral comparison, and, and Europeans come out um, on on the wrong end, right? The Europeans, Montaigne ultimately concludes, are the real cannibals in their in their uh, in the in the ways they consume each other in wars and all kinds of cruelties. These are some of the uses to which the new world could be put in European thought and literature and visual imagery. Okay, Michael, we have a comment here. Let me pass the mic from Mr. Stone. It's all yours. Mr. Stone, did you have a comment or a question? No, I was just writing. I was just writing some notes to some of the other participants talking about. Okay, how all right. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Okay, okay. sorry. Okay, Michael, take it away. Okay. Um, now, uh, Jacques Lemoyne is one really interesting point of comparison. Uh, another one um, is another French comparison, actually, uh, is the Drake manuscript. And this is a collection of visual images that was created by, uh, it's not exactly clear, but at least it's, it's thought two French artists who were actually, French Protestant artists who, who were uh, part of Sir Francis Drake's voyages around around the Atlantic and around the world, really, in the 1580s and, and early 1590s. And this is a, a volume that's relatively recently entered into the collection of the Morgan Library in New York. And in fact, I would encourage you to go to the Morgan Library's website because they have a great um, uh, set of images that you can lo uh, look through and, and explore the whole volume. Uh, but um, interestingly, one of one of the images recorded in the Drake manuscript is is based upon Virginia. At least one. It's actually, I think, more more than one. Uh, the the Anne de Loranbeck is as it's titled, the Indian of Loranbeck, and Loranbeck is the word that they use to describe the area that's that the English called Virginia. And this is done in 1586. The Drake, Sir Francis Drake, actually stopped to the Roanoke colony and took some of the colonists from the first attempt at, at colonizing it back to England. Um, and so these artists presumably were on that voyage and, and depicted um, some of the same Indians that John White depicted. And it's interesting to uh, compare the two. And actually, here, this might be a good point to invite a little bit of conversation as with comparison. I think if this is the kind of comparison that might be productive to, to bring into the classroom, ask students to talk about ways in which say John White and this very, these very different um, artists approach their encounter with unfamiliar peoples. Okay. How would you compare the, uh, the two images we have here? And while people are preparing their answers, I can point out too that the Drake manuscript drawings are also available on our American Beginnings website. Oh, okay. Right. And we sent, uh, we sent you to, uh, to that site in preparation for this seminar. So how would we compare these these two, the white on the left and the Drake manuscript drawing on the right? Well, for one thing, the, the uh, 
the, the one on the left is far more elegant mm -hmm. yeah. and graceful in the pose. And, and the, the artistry is, I think, much more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're, um, you know, we're looking at, and I think you can tell this from just simply looking at the two of them, the difference between a, uh, a trained artist and uh, an artist who is um, who, who does, doesn't have a formal training. I see just looking over to the side here that um, this was one person is saying that White's is much more welcoming, and I think that's an interesting um, description. He's, I think it's right. I mean, the, the, the ways in, in which White's naturalism invites us into this world, it's a kind of visual language we're familiar with. It's, it's a kind of, it has the sense of um, uh, familiarity Whereas the uh, the Drake manuscript artists, I know we can we can talk about a certain naivete to their approach or a, a simplicity to their uh, approach, uh, and, and yet it's very compelling in its own way. Um, you know, there's not the interest in modeling form, and again, all of these things that one would learn as as a trained artist. John White, it's inter I should point out, probably uh, was probably trained as a miniaturist in England, making miniatures. Uh, miniature portraits, and so probably had a formal artistic training in that way, but it doesn't seem to be the case with Drake manuscript artists. Um, but th there's other, here are a couple more images uh, from the Drake manuscript on the right-hand side, and another image by John White that, uh, on the left-hand side, and they're somewhat similar subject matter that makes this, I think, a kind of interesting point of comparison. And again, to get back to that idea as John White's images being more welcoming. I think that's a, an especially good description but in looking at a comparison like this, uh, where you have John White in, in showing the Algonquins in their fishing practices and, and describing for us, for example, the way that they spear fish and the way that they construct these weirs in order to hold a captured or in order to capture fish, um, showing us the, the, the various kinds of fish that are swimming under the waters as well. Um, I guess it's important to look at an image like the looking at an image like this. It's important to think about something I mentioned earlier on that this was um, one of the reasons for John White's visual images were to attract interest in the New World, uh, to attract um, you know the the, Euro, the uh, English were interested in settling Virginia. They wanted the, these Virginia to appear inviting to Europeans, uh, and John White's works are, again, are welcoming in that way. They, they, what we see when we look at John White's is an ordered world, a world that has a certain sense of familiarity to it, uh, uh, an ordered nature, uh, a world where nature is under control. Uh, the Drake Manuscript seems in its directness uh, of these artists often seems to offer a world that's perhaps less in control. So when the artists depict these sea creatures, for example, you know, they're, they're, they're interested in these unfamiliar creatures, but there's also a certain menace, I suppose, to the way these, these, these uh, sea creatures are depicted uh, in the figure, for example, of the um, manta ray at the top about to swallow this uh, uh, figure swimming in, in front of it, or the Tiburon shark uh, down below. Um, Who's uh, the, the, the caption of this one, for example, the Tiburon Shark says that uh, sailors will sometimes fall overboard or go swimming and they'll be torn limb from limb by these ferocious sharks. Uh, so, so there's this sense that um, nature is and, and this unfamiliar world is something that can, you know, is extremely dangerous and uh, is uh, something to be feared. And, and so the, here you see, in a really interesting contrast, the two sides of this encounter with the unfamiliar, right? The, uh, a desire for familiarity, a desire to, to see the new world as being something like Europe, and also this maybe fascination with, but also fear of the difference of this world. Yeah, and the white drawings, too, would suggest to their viewers that you can control the nature of the new world, whereas the Drake manuscript, uh, you can't. Yeah, I mean, it's that difference between, I think that's a good way of thinking about it, about control versus lack of control. I mean, this is what you know, Europeans were dealing with. And, and what's important to remember, too, is that how, how little control Europeans did have. I mean, you know, we, we think about, you know, th these are the very earliest attempts at colonization. The, the, um, the, the, the peoples that the Europeans encountered, they, you know, these early colonies had virtually no impact. Um, and they, they were very slow in getting started. 
uh, there were many reasons for Europeans to be anxious about the kind of control they had about this world. And that's why it's really remarkable to see John White's body of images suggesting um, this kind of welcome, welcoming world, the sense of a world that is under the control of the uh, European artist. <coughs> Uh, and one more comparison, just because I, I, I love it so much, is the, the, the uh, here, here again is John White interested in the bugs of the new world, uh, uh, d depicting fireflies in a very poetic way. He depicts the firefly on the top portion of the page in three different positions with, with the wonderful caption of fire, uh, 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 a fly which in the night seemeth a flame of fire. And then uh, down below, he has a different insect, a, a dangerous biting fly, he labels it. And here's John White interested in, interested in the unfamiliar, but interested in knowing it and getting no, gaining knowledge about it, seeing the firefly with its wings in three different positions. In, in fact, in, interestingly, these very fireflies were copied by John White when they returned to, to England and given to naturalists in London who then uh, cut them out and pasted them into a, a book that they um, that a couple of these naturalists were making about the insects of the world. So they, they were very much part of a knowledge making enterprise. You couldn't really use the Drake manuscripts image of mosquitoes on the right hand side for the same purposes. You see the uh, um, this artist really interested in giving you the experience of what it, uh, what it's like to step outside into a landscape swarming with these um, you know, dangerous bugs and it'll, it'll bite you all over. And perhaps it's partly because I'm from Minnesota that I appreciate this, but I'm sure all you Floridians appreciate it just as much as I do in Minnesota. And the, the passage that goes with that uh, <clears throat> drawing of the mosquitoes describes that, that, uh, that uh, horror of going out and getting these things biting you. He says it raises uh, welts on your skin the size of peas. And those captions, by the way, are translated in mm -hmm. uh, American Beginnings. So if you go to the Drake manuscript there, you will find all the captions yeah. translated yeah. for you. Just as fascinating for the captions, really, as, as for the visual images themselves. Um, now, so, you know, we've been looking at John White in relationship to how other peoples are depicting, or other, other artists are depicting the New World at, at the same time. Uh, and really thinking in particular about John White as somebody who's bringing this um, really intense Renaissance naturalism into his works, describing what he sees and being careful to describe in, in detail. And yet I, I also want us to think about this question of how, how does John White's art, even as, it's, as we see it as this remarkably anthropological work, scientific description, how does it reflect his own cultural background? How does it reflect his own point of view? as an Elizabethan Englishman working in, in the uh, late 16th century. And may, maybe this is, is something to talk about, to, to think about as a group too. I, mean, I wonder if anybody has uh, ideas that, to bring to, to that question. How do these pictures reflect White's own English point of view? Any comments on that? I think, for one thing, Michael, the, the po would, what about the posing there of the mm -hmm. people? Uh, does that reflect uh, his classical training, the stance, Laura? Yeah, Lincoln, right, question. right. Um, yeah, I, I think that's one of the um, the chief ways in, in which you really uh, see that. It's great, it's great that people have picked up on that. Mm -hmm. the, the the poses of the, for, for example, the person with the folded arms there, the chief heroine. A uh, heroine is an Algonquin word for a, a figure of authority in Algonquin society. And uh, interestingly, Uli White is interested in using Algonquin language and depicting um, the, these figures. But he, so he stands there with his hands posed that really uh, um, in, in, in folded in that way that signifies the authority of the figure. It's a, a stance that you might find in a European image. Or uh, take the, the figure on the left-hand side of the screen here of the standing warrior. Um, who is standing with his elbow pointed outwards and resting on his hip. That kind of stance comes directly out of Elizabethan portraiture conventions. So for example, uh, the portrait of Sir Walter Raleigh on the right-hand side of the screen, again, a figure directly involved in the Roman voyages himself um, in, in supporting them, uh, is shown in that very same stance. 
and and so and you know it's it's a gesture of of authority in that way. Janine Lumpkin has mentioned the role of women here and uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the way the woman is the caregiver to the child. Yeah, uh, this and this is interesting too. Uh, it's it's a mother and child together, and in one way that can be seen in relationship to similar kinds of family pairings. Again, like Sir Walter Raleigh and his son, that was a, a convention as a, of Elizabethan portraiture. Um, White chooses to show the Elizabethan, uh, the young Elizabeth. I'm sorry, the young Algonquin girl, not by herself, but in relationship to a mother figure. And he's very much interested. Actually, let me go back where we see that image a little bit larger. Uh, it's a, this is, I think, one of White's most interesting watercolors, where you have, and for one, one reason being, too, not, not just the relationship between mother and daughter, about which we could say more about, but also for what the, fig, the daughter is holding in her hand. Uh, she's holding a, a, a European doll in her hand, and this is the only one of John White's images that actually includes in that way a sign of the European encounter with the natives. Um, whereas, say, again, in Jacques Lemoyne, you see that encounter again and again in his images. This is the only way that you see that in John White's work, and only in an indirect manner at that. But, but it's an interesting. She seems to be holding up this Elizabethan doll for her mother to look at. At the same time, so, so suggesting the kind of influence that the English might have on her through bringing these new dolls and these new playthings for her. But at the same time, she's emulating her mother in this very unusual gesture. This is certainly not a convention taken out of Elizabethan portraiture. Here's John White looking at an Algonquin habit of the women resting their hands sling-like in these um, sort of necklace slings around their necks and, and showing how then the, the Algonquin daughter adopts the same a stance and emulates her mother, mimics her mother. So there's this interesting reflection here, I guess we could see it as, this interesting reflection of how um, culture is handed down through the family, through figures of authority, both from mother to daughter, but also through this, this figure of the doll from English to Algonquins in that way. So there's a kind of reflection on influence and cultural contact um, through an image like this. Okay, we've got about 30 minutes, Michael. Okay. Um, another really interesting way that we can think about, uh, or uh, opportunity we have to think about how John White and Theodore Debris bring their own cultural preconceptions into these visual images is, by, is through this great contrast or comparison we, we can make between John White's originals and Theodore Debris copies. Um, again, we don't have this opportunity, say, with Jacques Lemoyne because the originals don't survive, but we can make these comparisons with John White. Uh, and so we have uh, Debris making a lot of interesting choices when he when he copies White's work and begins to circulate it through his published engravings, he adds landscapes, for example, which perhaps lend to that sense of a, you know, and, and lush landscapes with uh, figures in the background hunting deer. Uh, so it's a landscape full of, of game and, and it's a fertile landscape. The English reports, again, this is all part of this English desire to present the, the New World in a very positive light for potential European colonists and investors. That their first English reports on America are that this is a this is an Edenic world. Um, there are grapes growing everywhere you look. There are um, it's it's um, it's it's temperate. The climate is temperate. Temperate. It's fertile. It's like a coming to the Garden of Eden. And John White's or Theodore Debris by adding these landscapes sort of lends that inviting quality. Um, at the same time, he doubles, interestingly, he doubles White's figures in order to show them from back and behind, showing that he sort of kind of studies in these figures, and, 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 but also kind of translates them too, so um, gives them more European-like features, uh, enhances, classicizes them, uh, puts them more into the language of classical antiquity that Theodore Debris 
uh, was very much trained in. So they look more a bit more like Greek sculptures, perhaps, than they do in John White's original images. Uh, and also the captions are interesting because Theodore de Brie <laughs> familiarizes the titles that White gives these figures. So whereas White uses words like a great heroine, which is this Algonquin word, um, Debris, Debris uses, this is the caption that he uses down below here, he uses that word, he writes it as Werowin, uh, but also calls the figure a great lord of Virginia. Right? So you begin to be able to see them in an English language of authority rather than just a purely uh, Algonquin language. Well, here, this is a, um, uh, an interesting case of Debris' translation where you have the, the image of the, the mother and daughter being translated by, by Debris and, and some interesting changes being made. Uh, a, uh, so uh, again, the caption itself, no longer is it a chief heroine's wife, not using that Algonquin language, but a chief lady. You know, it's back into that language of ladies and lords that are familiar to, to the English. Uh, and Debris writes, uh, commonly the young daughters of seven or eight years old, wait upon them, wearing about them a girdle of skin. After they be, after 10 years old, they wear deer skin. So describing customs and costumes, they're greatly delighted with puppets. And so you see the, 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 uh, um, the doll is copied, or puppets and babes just mean words that mean dolls, which were brought out of England. But interestingly, Debris in her other hand, instead now of making her mimic her mother in that gesture, um, is, has given her another English toy. Right, a rattle. So uh, Debris seems to want to emphasize that uh, that influence that the English and the Europeans can have over the natives of the New World, and this, um, and the, so the sort of welcoming that the the Europeans might expect when they come with their trinkets and toys and offer them uh, to to the native peoples. One person in the chat noticed <clears throat> that the uh, uh, Debris uh, drawings have more European faces. Yes, they do absolutely, and and again, uh, it's uh, um, I think all part of this process of of translation, which is a process of Europeanizing the figures on on Debris' part. There, white white does you know to get back to that idea of this in interest in the difference and in recording that difference of the new world. White is is notable for more than any other artist of the time, attending to native facial features in a way that other artists don't. So even if you look at Jacques Lemoyne's images, they're very Europeanized in a way that John White's aren't. Uh, or one more, this is one of also a really interesting watercolor by John White that he labels the flyer. And this is a figure of a shaman in Algonquin society. And he, White, White, John White calls him the flyer because it's, it's a figure who has the power to engage in magical flight between worlds, between uh, the human world and the spirit world. Um, Debris translates this figure I mean, very faithfully in a lot of ways. Uh, there is a process of Europeanizing, um, absolutely, and adding the landscape and all of this background and that's inviting. But but also now labels him instead of using White's term the flyer, and you can see you know White probably searching here for you know what what English word can we use to describe the the function of this of this figure within Algonquin society. Debris in, in this more popular text that circulated so widely around Europe, calls him, um, he calls him the conjurer. And in doing that, sort of fits this figure into a European language of, of um, magic and witchcraft that would have been familiar to um, European readers. I mean, this was a real concern throughout Europe in the 16th century. This was the century of the so-called witch craze. And, and European, you know, many, many, particularly female, Females went to trial, were, were tried and executed for the practice of witchcraft in the 16th century. It was a constant um, concern, and that's the seems to be in, in that language of witchcraft that uh, and model of witchcraft that that Debris situates this particular figure. It's part of his translation, and even the language of, in the caption. Right, they commonly have conjurers and jugglers, which jugglers is another word used to describe a magician. They use strange gestures and often contrary to nature in their enchantments. They're very familiar with devils. Okay, so you can, uh, again, you can see the way of, of Debris trying to make this figure understandable to his European audience through what they're familiar with, with, which is the figure of the witch 
in Europe. It's also interesting that sort of you know witches and witchcraft in Europe was a, a practice associated with figures at the margins of society. They were Europe's others, and this is the language then that and the, and the models that are then being applied to these uh, unfamiliar peoples. Okay, um, well, in, in, uh, while we still have time, I'd like to move on a little bit, too, to think about s some other questions as well, um, particularly the, uh, the historical questions. And I, and I know, especially for those of you who, who teach uh, kids at a, at a younger level, it's, it's hard to get students to think historically. Um, it's hard to get college students to think historically. Um, but I think, actually, visual images are a really good way to do that. And, and I'm hoping you might find some ways to translate some of the issues I bring up here to your students. Um, it, I think a really interesting question to ask of these images is how John White's contemporaries might have looked at these images, and also what motivated what what you know what motivated John White to make these, what concerns of the 16th century motivated him to to, to produce them, what, what are the contexts we can place them in. And one of the contexts that we really need to think about with them is collecting uh, in this period. And this is a really fascinating subject in in uh, in relationship to the Renaissance. The Renaissance is the, uh, a lot of new things start happening in, in the European Renaissance, and one of them is the development of museums. Um, the earliest museums, the ancestors of today's art museums and natural history museums emerge in the 16th century, and we call them cabinets of curiosities. And there were these spaces for collecting all kinds of objects, all kinds of exotic objects, many of them objects from the New World. And this is one of the places, one of the chief sites that um, objects and visual images coming back from the New World were destined for in Europe, were, were these collections. So I, I give you an, an example of one of these places on the screen here, uh, and we actually have a, a record of, the, of this particular collection thanks to a Swiss traveler who went through Europe in the late 16th century by the name of Thomas Plotter, and he visited London, and one of the places that this traveler visited when he was in London was the Cabinet of Curiosities of Sir Walter Cope. And um, th this, is, this, this is what he says about Cope. I won't read through this whole thing, but just to give you a sense of it. He says, this same Mr. Cope inhabits a fine house. And this is where these collections would be. They would be in the houses of, of scholars. Um, and he says, um, he led us into an apartment stuffed with queer foreign objects in every corner. And amidst other things I saw there, the following seemed of interest. Um, and he, you know, he lists things like an African charm made of teeth, uh, shoes from many strange lands, um, uh, the horn and tail of a, a rhinoceros, uh, an embalmed child, the bauble and bells of Henry VIII's fool, a unicorn's tail, fl a flying rhinoceros, whatever that is, flies which glow at night in Virginia instead of lights, since there is often no day there for over a month, uh, which of course is why I put John White's. Um, uh, image of fireflies up on the screen, and who knows? Maybe it's, it's entirely possible that the fireflies from Virginia, which apparently is what this this, this traveler traveler encountered in Sir Walter Cope's collection, um, they may well have been brought back from Virginia by John White, or perhaps from some subsequent um, um, voyage to Virginia. Um, but then adding this sort of interesting report, th this kind of hearsay that you see again and again about the new world, things like there's often no day there for over a month. Um, what what um, is po possibly being done here is a conflation of reports coming back from English expeditions into northern territories, into the Arctic, uh, and, and reports about Virginia. And then, of course, uh, other fascinating things here. And the, it, it, there, there's an interesting logic to this process of collecting because the, these these objects, these what, what interested collectors was um, their exotic qualities, the way that they're different from anything one might normally encounter, and so they were not brought into these early museums in order to classify them and to, and to order knowledge, um, in the way that our museums tend to work today. Right when you go through a museum, you know, say you go through a natural history museum, you're going to probably go through um, 
you know, it's probably good. Objects are probably going to be ordered by time period or species or you know, different ways we have of ordering knowledge. But the Cabinet of Curiosities was all about the strangeness of each particular object and the, and the capacity of those individual objects to inspire wonder and fascination. So that to get you to stand in awe before, for example, a crocodile. I mean, this is the thing, if you had a cabinet of curiosities, you had to get a crocodile and hang it from the ceiling, right? as you have, see in this picture of a cabinet of curiosities in, in Naples. And, you, and one might stare there as these figures standing in the cabinet do and point to this crocodile and, and stand in wonder at, at the, the strange workings of nature as you look at that very unusual, exotic creature. And John White's, the kind of things that he depicted in Virginia um, would have inspired the same kind of response among European viewers. And again, probably, you know, John White, his, his watercolors survive in this collection of, of, of images, but John White probably brought back actual objects from Virginia as well, and, and likely these objects made their way into people's collections, like Sir Walter Cope's. Michael, a quick question, very mm -hmm. briefly. How did the people uh, determine what to include? Was it simply based on the exotic quality of the object? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that was the main consideration. I mean, w there were ways of, of dividing objects up, I mean, um, but not by the kind of categories that we're familiar with. Uh, works of, um, uh, one of, one of the key categories was works of nature and works of art. And, and so you have these things, again, th these are, today we have art museums and natural history museums, they're separate institutions, but these are combined together in the Cabinet of Curiosities. And one of the things that you're supposed to wonder at when you're going into the Cabinet of Curiosities is the ways in which artfulness and nature interconnect with each other. And this actually brings us back to that theme of where art and nature intersect in John White's work. Uh, because when you look at the crocodile or you look at a shell, and here, let me just move on to the, uh, another image. These are just a bunch of John White's watercolors and sort of these exotic objects. When you look at that shell, right there of John White's, you look at that not just as an object of nature, but of nature's, of the artfulness of nature, the artfulness of God. I mean, there's a kind of religious awe that's supposed to be behind this as well. And so the, the Cabinet of Curiosities is meant to get you as a viewer to reflect upon the ways in which human art can sometimes, you know, exceed to surpass nature and the way in which nature in its own artfulness uh, um, uh, um, exceeds the artfulness of human creations. Uh, shells were really one of the objects of fascination because they have such artful designs on them. But just, you know, the things like an alligator or, or a hermit crab, these are these exotic creatures which were unusual and incredibly artful you know, for these European viewers. And, and I think this is a really good way to think about John White is, is as a collector, looking for the exotic, looking for the difference that which is different. And actually this is, I think, another way perhaps of getting students to think about uh, how an artist like John White, um, making his work interesting. Because you know, a really interesting question might be for students, you know, what, when you go to an unfamiliar place, what do you look for? What do you draw as an artist? What attracts your vision? Uh, and uh, certainly for John White, he was looking for artful objects, exotic objects. Um, one of the things we're lucky to have is a set of instructions for an artist going to the New World. And not the actual set of instructions given to John White, but given to an artist on an earlier voyage, um, though that artist actually died on that voyage and we don't have whatever that artist made. But the instructions from the whoever gave him his orders to go to the New World and draw things was to draw to life all strange birds, beasts, fishes, plants, herbs, trees, and fruits, and bring home of each sort as near as you may, which he means as many um, different kinds as as you can. So that you know the the uh, his the artist's brief, the artist's instructions were to go out and find everything that's different, find everything that's unfamiliar. Uh, and, and again, this was the goal of the cabinet of curiosities. And Mike, we have about 10 minutes. <clears throat> okay, um, so let's just uh, go through maybe another couple contexts here for thinking about John White's historical context, which I, I think translate in really interesting ways to our own current concerns 
and maybe, it, though I don't have contemporary images to bring in to relate to these, I think one certainly could bring in modern images to make White herself more understandable. Um, so one thing to think about in John White's work is costume. Uh, like a lot of his contemporaries, John White was really interested in um, um, making an inventory of all the different costumes of peoples of the world. It's, it's a way of, in the 16th century, you know, you have all these voyages to different parts of the world, this new awareness of people living across the globe, and you, and you have a real desire then to, to make sense of this. Of course, the the Cabinet of Curiosities was one was one way of doing that, but it was also uh, at the same time there, there was so much so much new information coming in, so much difference that it was hard to make sense of it. And again, the Cabinet of Curiosities is not a way to bring order to things; it's a way to admire their difference and their exotic qualities. But in any case, one way to uh, artists responded to this expanding world was through an interest in costumes. And John White is very much part of that interest. There's all kinds of costume books being published at this time. Uh, um, in the 16th century was a great age for the costume book. Um, and John White, you know, he, here's a few examples on the screen of studies he he made of both histor costumes from history and costumes from different geographical areas. And these are all included in his album of watercolors. So you have things like historical figures like a Roman soldier and an interest in the costume that that figure might have. Or what does the Duke of Genoa wear? Um, what does a Turkish woman look like? White's depictions of Algonquins need to be understood alongside costume studies like that. And an interest in the way in which culture, a person's culture, a person's um, background is defined by what they wear on the surface of their body, what they wear on their costumes. One really interesting episode uh, that that gets at the significance of costume is the Inuit that were brought back to England in the 1570s and that White and other artists depicted. Uh, I, I mentioned these voyages to the Arctic that the English were engaged in, and, and uh, an English voyager by the name of Martin Frobisher made multiple voyages in the latter part of the 1570s to Baffin Island, which is up near Hudson's Bay in the, near the Arctic. And um, from each of these expeditions, they, they brought back uh, Inuit captives uh, unwillingly uh, on the Inuit's part. And they brought them back to Bristol in, in England, and as soon as these captives were brought back, there was you know this intense public fascination. Artists were brought in, and they depicted these figures. So, for example, in 1576, a captive was brought back, and the Flemish artist Lucas de Hare um, made this portrait that you see on the left-hand side of this Inuit captive. John White, in 1577, came to Bristol and depicted um, an Inuit captive brought back by Frobisher that year. Interestingly, in that case, we know from reports the actual name of the captive. We know he was named Calicho, and he was one of several captives that were brought back. And, and John White actually also makes a, uh, a, a depiction that I don't show you here of a female uh, and her child that, that were brought back as well. Um, behind, and you know, th there's this real interest in the, the costume of the Inuit. But also, in th th there's a really interesting thing that happens in, in, at this moment that we don't have these surviving visual images, but we can maybe relate them to what does survive. We, we do know from reports that in 1576, so when this captive was pictured by Lucas de, Heer, de Heer, another artist was commissioned uh, to, to make three different portraits or portraits of, of three different kinds of the Inuit captive. One was to show the captive in their native dress. So what, the kind of portrait you see by Lucas de Hare here. And that kind of portrait presumably was to give you a sense of the figure as, as a figure of difference, right? A figure that was very different than Europeans, uh, a figure that was savage, uh, uh, homme sauvage, it reads at the top. It's a savage man, um, and his costume signifies that. But at, on the... At the same time, this artist was also commissioned to portray the Inuit captive in English dress. And so um, he was dressed up in English clothing and depicted in English clothing. Um, that's an interesting decision, and it suggests 
um, that the, the viewers and, and the people who commissioned the portrait were interested in the idea and the power of clothing to transform the savage into the Englishman, right? And the idea that clothing itself can make that transformation possible, that you, who you are is defined by what you wear. And there was actually a third portrait too, which was to show the figure naked, uh, which um, again, that invites speculation as you know, why, why make a portrait like that? And I, I think maybe one way we can think about that is that uh, an, uh, it was an interest, it comes out of an interest in um, you know, what, who, is, who is the person without clothing? What does that mean? I mean, this is the unaccommodated condition. Not to have clothing is not to have, not to be savage and not to be civilized. It's to be without any identity at all. In other words, the idea is that clothing itself is what gives you identity. And even though we don't have these actual studies, these actual paintings that survive, uh, there is this interesting image on the left-hand side here that can maybe help us get thinking about them. This is a naked, the portrayal of a naked Englishman by Lucas de Hare, the same artist who showed us the, that picture of the Inuit. And this is actually included in the same album of watercolors by this artist. And there's an interesting story behind this watercolor on the left. Um, it's kind of damaged, but it's it's a depiction of a native uh, of an Englishman holding a bolt of cloth in one hand and a pair of scissors in the others. And the story is that when Lucas de Hare did his costume book, he showed all the different nations and peoples of the world and their in their respective costumes. And when he got to the Englishman, he couldn't decide what to show him because one day the English will be wearing the, you know, the, the costume of a Spaniard and the next day of an Italian and then the next day of a Frenchman. They're always just concerned with fashion. And, and so you don't really know who the Englishman is. And so Lucas de Hare gives him the, the cloth and the scissors so he can make whatever costume he wants to for himself um, uh, because he doesn't know who he is, uh, basically. And, and it's a sense, it gives you the sense that um, who you are is defined on the surface of your body, defined by what you wear. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, as John White explores these different costumes of the natives of the New World, he's exploring also the way in which we come to define ourselves as humans by, uh, by our outer garments. Okay, Michael, we have a question here. Andrea, my, uh, my crown's yours. Thank you. I just want to mention several people have mentioned the moon in the background and one of the significance and actually was afraid to ask. So I thought I would ask. The them. moon in the background? That's that. Uh, oh, yeah, this? you got it there. Yeah, Michael. it looks like the moon, but it's, it's actually not and the it was moon. In it's, several it's, pictures. The, it's the, uh, yeah, these are, it's a practice that uh, thankfully has gone out of, a pra out of practice, but this is the stamp of the Ghent University Library where this is kept. <laughs> and the British, you've probably seen them on some of John White's drawings too, those would be the British Museum stamps. Oh, um, okay, thank you. Um, this, uh, I'm not, some of John White's images are stamped in that way. So a lot of these old drawings, you, you see that and it, it actually does damage <laughs> them and you don't see it done anymore. Um, uh, I know we're running out of time and I have, how much time do we have left, Richard? Oh, uh, we have about two minutes, but I don't think the folks would mind if we went a little over. Okay, okay. well, uh, this is a really an image that may, many of you may have encountered before, one of the really famous images from the, this early period of encounter with American Indians. And it really gets at that notion of, of how costume defines the individual in the way that I've been talking about. This is the an engraving of Pocahontas by, uh, done in England by a Dutch engraver in, in, uh, in 1616. And uh, in Poca the story of Pocahontas is that she that she comes to England and she marries the Englishman. Ultimately, you know, she, she has her whole story with with John Smith and saving John Smith from uh, execution. Uh, ultimately, marries the Englishman John Rolfe and comes to England. Ultimately, she dies there, but um, she uh, her portrait is painted as, as soon as she gets there. And how is she shown? She's not shown in her native dress. She's shown dressed as an English woman, and um, it, this says, interestingly, the, the caption itself, in a way, dramatizes that transformation into from from um, uh, native to uh, Native American to English woman. Matoa, which is her Powhatan name, uh, alias Rebecca, her English name, 
the daughter of the most powerful Prince Powhatan, Powhatan Emperor of Virginia. So this is um, Matoaka as or becoming Rebecca through this change of clothing. Um, and, and she's dr interestingly dressed here in the most fashionable of English costumes as well. So it's getting at that idea of the power of costume and gives you that sense of why John White might have been interested in costume in that way. And one last thing I'll mention about, maybe, maybe this is a kind of uh, a, a, a last point to make uh, that will help us get some historical understanding of this and can help us contextualize it, is that um, um, John White's work is in really in interesting ways tied to the theater of the period. And Shakespeare in, in, in is somebody who is really useful. You know, I know you're not reading Shakespeare in fifth grade, but perhaps for you high school teachers, Shakespeare is somebody to think about alongside John White's work. Um, Shakespeare, again and again, uh, not, not only, he, he, for one thing, he includes New World figures and references to the New World, and this is why I have the reference to The Tempest here, because The Tempest is very much a play with the savage figure of Caliban about the kind of, you know, the encounter with the savage figure by the, by the European in the New World, and uh, it's full of all kinds of um, ideas that are taken straight out of the travel literature of the period, but also, you know, why, this is an interesting, interesting question, why was Shakespeare's, why were, the, why were his plays, why was his theater so popular in England at the very time that John White was making these images? And it's because, his, part of the reason is because his plays were so much about costume and about the power of costume to transform one's identity. So to see, for example, the figure of Pocahontas here this native woman dressed up as an English woman is, is really an exploration of the same kind of thing that when you see you know, one, of, one of Shakespeare's characters, one of Shakespeare's women dressing up as a man during a play, and the audience through a figure like that witnesses the power of clothing, of stage props and stage clothing to transform the identity of a player on the stage through the addition of clothes. That's, what, that's one of the things that Shakespeare's um, plays explore, and, it, and it's something that provoked fascination among audiences, but also provoked anxiety. A lot of people criticized the theater because it, it allowed people of low social rank to dress up as kings and queens on stage uh, and therefore threw, threw society into disorder. Um, the whole goal of the costume book and the whole goal of costume studies like John's, John White's is to depict people in their proper costumes in order to show how they have their place in the world and they, they, they belong in their particular environment. Um, and, and so the, yeah, the, the, I had more things to say, but I think um, through, through the little captions that I put on some of these um, PowerPoint slides and, and some of the questions that I raised that um, perhaps going through this PowerPoint, you can um, have a sense of, of some of the other directions that I wanted to talk about. I think we got mo through most of the material that I wanted to, and again, I'm, I'm happy to uh, take, um, you know, I will respond to questions um, as well, um, beyond the seminar, as Richard mentioned at the beginning. Okay, <clears throat> so let me just click on through here till we get to the very end. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me <clears throat> ask you if we have asked all of your questions. If you have any questions or comments uh, before we close out, please make them now. Uh, and let me emphasize that you have, you have been, uh, let's see, we have a hand up. Uh, Laura, okay, let me pass the microphone. Laura, it's all yours. I just wanted to um, thank you all for your amazing um, interactions. It was really very great to to see what you had to say. And I'm excited to, to see what you all put in the primary document form that you have to submit. And I just wanted to remind everybody of that and don't panic over it. You don't need to spend a lengthy period of time doing it, but I want you to capture some of these you know, an image that you would like to use in your classroom, how you might use it. It doesn't mean you you have to create a whole lesson plan, it, but but fill in the, the different categories as much as is applicable and and make sure that you upload that because that is one of the requirements. So I just want to make sure that kind of got in there because I really am excited to see all the great ideas that you all chatted about. Thanks. 
Well, thank you. And indeed, you did have some great ideas, and I hope that you will post them to the form if you have any more uh, be, you know, as we close out here. Uh, please do that, and if you have any questions or comments that you would like Professor Gaudio to address, he'll be monitoring the form until December 3rd. Uh, let's see, we have another comment here from Mr. Stone. Mr. Stone, the microphone's yours. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, I was wondering if there's any evidence, can you tie the primary source from the actual pictures to primary sources that show that the that people were transformed by the costumes that they were? Uh, what was the very last part? I didn't yeah, quite... We lost the last part. It got kind of garbled. If you could repeat that, please. Can you, is it possible to tie in the primary source, the pictures themselves, to costumes to show that people were transformed in the case that you gave the Pocahontas by the pictures, the clothes that they were wearing? Um, so, to, to, to tie in, say, the picture of Pocahontas to primary oh, documents? Is... Oh, that, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Oh, would there be any primary documents that might illuminate the picture of Pocahontas? Um, yeah, well, there is. Uh, we don't have specific writings about that particular portrait, unfortunately, but we do have a lot of literature from the period um, that uh, expressed usually anxiety about the power of, of costume in English society. For example, there were various pamphlets written about um, uh, women in uh, Elizabethan and, and Jacobean, under, you know, England under James I in the, in the early 17th century, dressing in outlandish clothing and that sort of upsetting all the, the kind of sense of social order. You have sermons um, that, that survive being mm -hmm. preached about um, not going overboard in the kind of dress that you wear. You have sumptuary laws from the period telling people that you need to wear by law the costumes that are appropriate to your social rank. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these documents kind of stress the, the significance of costume for dis defining who you are. And those are the kind of documents that give us a sense of the power of costume in the period and, and help us to read a picture like that of Pocahontas, which I think emblematizes the way in which the, the power costume has really to transform um, one's identity. That doesn't necessarily mean that transformed the, uh, Pocahontas's identity for herself, but for the audiences that saw her picture, um, it certainly would have defined who she was for them. Okay, Ms. Stone, if we if we didn't get that question for you, uh, you could put it in the form. It's part of your question got garbled, and I hope we answered it accurately and appropriately. But if it didn't, please go to the form, type it in, and we'll be sure to get back to you with, with a, a response uh, that, uh, that hits the nail right on the head. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our evening. Uh, let me remind you uh, to please submit your evaluations. And on behalf of Laura, let me remind you to do the uh, primary document application forms. Uh, we will be meeting again in another seminar. I don't have the date in front of me, but Laura does, and she'll be passing that information along to you. I do want to echo what she said. I want to thank you for your real uh, intelligent and energetic participation this evening. It was very impressive, and I want to thank Michael for giving us an excellent seminar. Yeah. So, and ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you as well. Yes. I, really, I really appreciate your input. It was a real pleasure for me to do this. This was one of the best ones we've done. I want to thank everybody. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, have a good evening and uh, looking forward to being with you again next time. Now, to exit the classroom, go up to the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You'll see the word file. Click on that. There'll be a drop-down menu. The last item in there says leave session. Click on that, and you're home free. Thank you, and good evening.